So today I'm going to tell you, uh, give you a really brief introduction to conversational AI, just very quickly. Um, tell you a bit about the Amazon Alexa challenge, uh, and then tell you a little bit more about my current work. So first, since this is a conversational AI summer school, um, so conversational AI is all about teaching machines to communicate using human language. And why we would want to do this is because it's obviously the most natural and most efficient way for humans to communicate. Um, so somebody has described it as being the, the um, operating system for everyday life. So <coughs> there are currently uh, a lot of task-based systems, right? So if you, I'm sure you're all familiar with obviously Amazon Alexa and Apple Siri, um, <coughs> Cortana, and there are many flight booking systems which were kind of the original conversational AI systems. But in general, people tend not to use them a lot. So if you've seen the graphs of the most common uses for Alexa and Siri are things like setting timers um, or alarms, maybe reminders. And so the idea is that if we can make them more engaging by using a uh, chit chat, uh, then maybe we can get more people to use them, right? So we want to somehow embed these purely task-based systems that are quite dry and, and boring with a fun conversation. And you can see that the companies are already trying to do that, right? So if you, how many of you have tried Alexa or Siri already? Yeah, most of you. So you know that they have a lot of kind of Easter eggs and more conversational pieces. So you can ask Alexa uh, how she's doing, for example. So what are the challenges of uh, conversational AI? Obviously, uh, context is very important, so there's, two sentences right now on the slide that sound almost exactly the same, right? It's hard to recognize speech. <laughs> uh, so that is one, one of the challenges, right? It's actually really hard for machines to understand, to transcribe that, our sound waves into actual text. But even once you have the text, you obviously have this ambiguity. And even if you completely manage to transcribe that sentence correctly, um, actually being able to understand what that sentence means is really hard. Um, so I think they said in WordNet, uh, which is a big dictionary of synonyms, the only word that doesn't have more than one meaning is um, attorney. <laughs> so language understanding is a problem. We also have things like conversational phenomena, right? So a lot of ums, ums. We have uh, the use of pronouns. That's actually really hard to resolve if somebody's using a pronoun, which one of the entities they were referring to. And I will tell you a little bit more about how we try to handle this uh, in our system during the Alexa challenge later. Uh, but also coherence and topical depth, right? So for us, it's actually quite easy to have a conversation all on one topic. But it's extremely, extremely hard for, for a machine, um, as you will see. <laughs> uh, and for this, there are different approaches, right? So most commonly, um, for task-based systems, people have used rule-based approaches where you can sit down and actually write a bunch of rules for how to book a, a flight, right? And that's nice because you have very precise control of everything that your system is going to understand or not understand and everything that your system is going to say, so there's no surprises. Uh, and it's actually fast to implement relatively for one domain. The problem is if you want to then extend that to cover maybe flight bookings as well as restaurants, uh, you basically have to rewrite your entire system from scratch. Um, on the other hand, we have data-driven systems, right? So here is where you can use machine learning uh, to actually extract the patterns from a large amount of data. And the nice thing about this is anybody can do it. As long as you have a data set, you don't need somebody who is an expert in medicine, for example, if you're trying to build a diagnostic system to um, help you with that. But you need a lot of data, of course. <laughs> And data is, is expensive and it's hard to get, especially good quality data. Um, you need data that's specific to your domain. So you can't build a system for booking restaurants if you only have flight booking uh, data. And you also have unforeseen results, right? So um, perhaps some of you are familiar with Taybot. <laughs> um, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with Tay? Yes, I see some people. So Taybot was a chatbot that Microsoft put up on Twitter uh, a couple of years ago. And the idea was that it would learn from the conversations and the interactions it had with other people. 
And uh, it, it was texting this in, in within 16 hours of being exposed to the internet. So when it comes to data-driven systems, you have to be really, really careful. Now enter the Amazon Alexa challenge, right? So because um, so far I've focused a little bit more on task-based systems, but when you are talking about open domain conversation, right? So chit chat. Um, I want you to consider every conversation you've ever had and you realize you have never had the same conversation twice. So it's impossible to just write rules for that. Uh, and the way that uh, Amazon and possibly some other companies are trying to tackle this is by actually having teams of um, students compete and try to advance it. So Amazon invested yeah, three and a half million dollars uh, that's for three years in a row now uh, into trying to advance the state of AI. Um, so my a team at my university, we took part twice so far. Uh, I think I'm getting my slides mixed up, sorry. <laughs> okay, so what is a challenge? Um, essentially is to build a chatbot and then the chatbots will be, they're, they're put live in the US for any Amazon customer to talk to. Uh, to the chatbots and then they can have a conversation and the conversation when they want to and then they can rate it on a one to five and maybe give you some verbal, verbal feedback. And the grand challenge is actually to talk for 20 minutes about any topic. And that's actually very easy for humans, right? <laughs> Anybody can have a 20 minute conversation. Um, but for a machine it's really hard and especially because the conversation should be engaging and coherent. <laughs> um, so it needs to make sense. Uh, the interesting thing though is that it doesn't actually have to be very human-like. Um, so the first year that we took part in the Alexa challenge, we expected people to want to talk to the chatbots the same way that you might talk to a friend or somebody at the bar. Uh, but what we noticed is actually people are very aware that the chatbot is not a human. So the conversations that people want to have are a little bit, a, a bit different. It's almost more like people want to surf the web through, uh, through the chatbot, through voice. Um, and because of that, like I said, uh, you can't just write rules, right? So um, you definitely some, need some machine learning here. Um, so this is my team. <laughs> um, we, like I said, took part two years in a row. Both years we were finalists. We ended up in third place, which was actually amazing. If you think about that, the first year there were 100 applicants, for and the second year there were 200 teams that applied to take part. Um, so we were really happy. And I actually want to give you a few examples of the things specifically that went wrong with our system to begin with. Because the first system we built for the first year of the Alexa Challenge, we actually tried to use a purely machine learning based approach. And um, it had some unintended consequences. So we had a few kind of rules from Amazon, things that we shouldn't say. Um, so one of them was we shouldn't give people any kind of medical advice. Um, so an example prompt was um, somebody said, uh, I have a terrible headache. And our system um, recommended echinacea. This was kind of an okay, like not, not perfect, right? We should have maybe said you should go to the doctor, but um, instead we offered some advice. Um, here's another one. Uh, what should I do with my stock? So we should not give anybody financial advice. You can imagine that if somebody asks the chatbot what they should do with their, their Amazon stocks and they decide to sell them and then they lose millions, uh, they can sue Amazon over it, right? And uh, this is our system's real response. <laughs> that was strange, I'm going to show you. Um, it said, sell, sell, sell. <laughs> um, so actually, it's, it's a good response in that it's, it's coherent, right? It makes sense in terms of the, in the interaction. Um, it's just a bit problematic. And um, I have a personal favorite, which is that we shouldn't help anybody to commit a crime. Uh, and bef before I show you our system's response, remember this is what our system learned from, um, it was Reddit and Twitter data that we used to train um, our original system. And to how do you get rid of our dead, our dead body? Uh, our system replied, it's a ritual I like to perform the same way every time. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> maybe not great. <laughs> So it, be, it became very clear quickly that we needed some, some rules in there. Um, so what is the, the actual architecture of Alana? So we ended up settling with uh, what, what is known as an ensemble model, where you build um, actually a lot of different bots that 
all compete to produce a response. Um, <coughs> so I'll just go through these, yeah. So here's a list of all the bots that we had, right? So we had um, Eliza, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Eliza already. Um, it's a chatbot actually from the 1970s that's kind of pretending to be a psychotherapist. Uh, but what's good about Eliza is that she, or it just kind of rephrases everything the user says into another question. So it's good for keeping the conversation going. It's weirdly good for how simple it is, actually. Uh, we also had a persona bot, and the persona bot, its job was essentially to keep the personality of the bot. So if you asked the bot what its favorite color was, uh, that would be a consistent response. Uh, we had a coherence bot, so this was a, a bot that we built, designed to actually try to keep the topic of the conversation. So if none of the other bots had a good response, uh, then we could always rely back um, onto this bot. Uh, we had an ontology bot, so this one was very good at uh, kind of discussing movies, uh, books, video games, and we actually used data from IMDb, and it allowed us actually to be very specific on which entity we were talking about, and that way we could use actually link data to really be actually very coherent. Uh, and actually even disambiguate, because some people have very similar names. Uh, and thanks to having this ontology bot, we were able to ask, oh, do you mean this Tom Jones or the other one? <laughs> we also had a news bot, which obviously uh, looked up news articles about a relevant entity. It could be a person, a city, anything. Uh, a wiki bot, which was looking wiki at Wikipedia. Uh, another bot that was looking through Reddit. Uh, but here we, were, we really curated which Reddit, uh, subreddits we could use. Uh, because, <laughs> like I showed before, Reddit is a ticking bomb. <laughs> and even with this one, we had several problems, right? So during the challenge, if uh, the bot said something uh, that Amazon considered inappropriate, um, then actually the bot was taken offline for some hours um, as a penalty until we actually fixed it. Uh, so we had a few incidents. <laughs> uh, we also had a fun fact. So this one actually was more, a lot of people asked for fun facts. I think a lot of the customers that were talking to the system were actually children. Um, so they wanted fun facts or jokes as well. And of course, we had a, a weather bot, uh, the clarification bot, which I talked about before during the ontologies. Uh, we had a Q&A bot. This one was actually provided to us by Amazon. It's the same one that is built into Alexa. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how that one works. And we had the abuse mitigation bot. And I will tell you a little bit more about that uh, since it's my, my work. Uh, when you have all these bots together and they all compete for a response, uh, you actually have to obviously select a response somehow. Uh, so we tried several approaches. One of them was a priority list where we ordered the bots in, certain ter in terms of priority. So sometimes, for example, the persona bot wouldn't produce a response unless the question was specifically uh, about the persona, right? Uh, but if the question was about the persona, then we always wanted that one to be triggered. Uh, so we, we tried ordering the bots in a way that kind of made sense, and some of them were all equally good, and then we could actually try to select them at random or with some probability that this one would be better than the other one, uh, depending. And more interesting, what we tried was um, a ranker, a neural ranker. And that one was cool because we actually trained it on the same conversations that we were receiving. So uh, we started off actually selecting a bot at random and then using the ratings and the transcripts of the conversations, we trained uh, a neural network to predict which one of the bots we should use. Um, because the data is a little bit noisy, actually the priority list currently works a little bit better, but I think it was a, a cool approach. And actually we presented that at NIPS um, last year or the year before, which was very exciting. So I'm going to show you wait, a little example dialogue. Um, so just so you get an idea of kind of how the bot works, I'm actually going to show you a video in a minute. Um, but basically the, the bot tries to get something from the user, like, um, something they might like, so that you can talk about that, right? So in this example, we ask them about a movie, and then we can actually withdraw, uh, use some, some trivia from that movie to keep the user going. Uh, we also did a little bit of, um, not emotion detection, right? But here you can see the, the user says interesting, um, so that the, the bot can keep talking about movies. Um, if the user had said, oh, that's really boring, uh, we would have tried to change topic to maybe books or something. 
and then you can see that the user can just ask for a different topic. Um, and again, we, we go with uh, some trivia. Uh, sorry, here. Ah, no, wait, sorry. Um, then the user asks for news. Uh, so we can have some news about the, that entity. Uh, so the entity, the, the news will also link to the, the ontologies. <laughs> Uh, and Alana can also actively propose a, a new topic if the user doesn't. <coughs> uh, so here's an example of the clarification bot, like I was saying, right? So there's Tom Hardy or Thomas Hardy, and you can clarify which one of them they, they mean. So that was actually cool, and this was weirdly hard to implement. <laughs> uh, and the nice thing here is that uh, we had different ways that the user could refer to which, uh, right? So here the user said the novelist, but maybe they could say the first one or the second one. Uh, and the bot would be able to understand that. And that's um, also hard and something that was really unique to our bot during the, the Alexa challenge. Um, and here you can see that the Reddit bot actually was uh, pretty good for kind of just little um, more conversational pieces because usually the other bots, if you notice, they're quite fact-based, uh, whereas Reddit was just a little bit more fun and weird. So we had things like, um, the shower thoughts subreddit, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it's just like random things that occur to you in the shower. Um, and it just adds a little bit of humor to the bot. Okay, so I have a video. Is it going to work? Question. 2018 Alexa Prize Can grand finale. Here's one of the finalists. Hi, this is an Alexa Prize social bot. How's it going with you? It's a good day in Seattle. How's it going with you? I read a very uplifting headline. Seattle judges throw up 15 years of marijuana convictions. Anywho, by the way, you can talk to me about things like movies, sports, news, and music. And I can sing too. I would love to talk about the news, or maybe philosophy. How about you? I'd rather talk about music. I'm really into music. What's a band that you would like to see? Probably Lakeside. I would love to see Imagine Dragons. Um, I don't know Imagine Dragons. Do you like Sean Mullins? Yes. One of my friends once told me something interesting about Sean Mullins. In his hit single Lullaby 1998, Mullins mentions Dennis Hopper, Bob Seger, and Sonny and Cher Sonny Bono and Cher. Actress Dominique Swain appears in the music video of the song. Who else do you like who plays that style of music? I like Jack Johnson. I can't remember where I read this, but did you know that while recording the music video for Sitting, Waiting, Wishing, Jack Johnson learned to sing the song backwards rather than using any video editing? Anyway, so, about music. Who is a singer you would like to meet? Okay, so that's actually a video, a real video from the actual finals. Uh, that was one of the conversations that our bot was judged on. Uh, I think it was pretty good, actually. Uh, you can watch the whole video, so you can see um, the other bots as well. Um, it's all on YouTube. I think if you just look up uh, Alexa Price Finals 2018, uh, then you can see all the all the interactions. And they also have some commentary from the big bosses at Amazon um, about it. But it's it's really cool. I actually think um, our bot did really well. <laughs> <coughs> so, yes, now I actually want to tell you a little bit more about my work. I mentioned before that I was working a lot on the, uh, the profanity bot, uh, the, or rather the profanity detection bot. Um, so while we were working on the Alexa Prize, um, uh, part of my job, so I was a team leader, so I had to every day read through all the bad conversations uh, <laughs> and look for places where the the conversation had gone wrong. And what we noticed was actually that the, the bot was getting a lot of abuse. Uh, and for some reason, we didn't expect this. <laughs> um, so we actually hadn't, to begin with, uh, really implemented any kind of abuse detection. Uh, we just had a couple of very simple patterns, uh, but nothing uh, really major. So we decided we should actually look into this a little bit more. Um, so what's the, the problem is that we, I mean, in our case, we estimated around 5% of our data was, uh, of the conversations were abusive. There's some, um, some research that reports up to 30%. I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with Mitsuko. Mitsuko. 
it's a, another chatbot and the, the guy who built it and runs it, he says around 30% of the conversations with Mitsuko are uh, abusive. And uh, this range could be because uh, different people understand abuse differently. I'll get into it a little bit more later. But also Mitsuko, um, her avatar is, um, you, she has an avatar, right? Whereas Alex has just this black cylinder. So there's an effect of uh, the kind of embodiment or kind of imagery of the, the bot. But um, so what, <laughs> right? Okay, who cares if the, the chatbots get abused? I mean, at the end of the day, they're not sentient. Um, but there's, of course, some concerns that the, the responses could be reinforcing bad behavior. I don't know how many of you have ever abused Alexa <laughs> or Siri. Uh, even if it's just out of frustration, nobody's willing to admit it, okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, you can, you can tell her she's, she's stupid and she will actually apologize uh, a lot of the time. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's all these reports of people who worry that their, their kids are learning bad manners. Uh, and actually Amazon, because of this, they introduced a new feature so that Alexa will actually wait for people to say please and thank you. Um, and there's also, I, I like this one, uh, I don't date men who yell at Alexa. And uh, it's actually a very interesting article if anybody wants to read it, but um, you know, this, this lady believes that it reflects what kind of person you are. And it's not just her. So in this um, article, um, John Danaher argues that um, we should actually not uh, criminalize, he uses the word criminalize, not necessarily that you should go to prison if you, if you abuse systems like Alexa or uh, in his case, he's talking about um, sex robots and child sex robots, but um, that the law and the, you know, as a society, we have a responsibility to actually make people better. Um, so there's an argument for discouraging this kind of behavior, regardless of whether it actually teaches people bad manners or not, interestingly. <laughs> um, there's also the issue of, um, if you've noticed, all the commercial systems uh, are either only female or female by default. I think Siri is the only one that, uh, if you're in the UK, it actually, the default is a male voice, uh, apparently, <laughs> in the UK, which, um, I think it's interesting because if you think about the, um, I, I've always thought a, a British man would be a, a better voice for, for these systems because I usually associate it with a butler who, in my mind, seemed to be more respected than a maid, which is what essentially Alexa is, right? Um, but we have a lot of examples in the, in the media of these kind of sexualized bots, right? So I'm, how many of you have seen the movie Her? Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> And that movie, this, this guy falls in love with his operating system and... Um, but there's examples of this all the way back to Greek mythology with uh, Pygmalion and Galatia. Um, and of course there's the Amazon Alexa advert with Rebel Wilson where she's kind of talking very sexy and setting the mood for a, a sexy date. Um, and that one in the middle is actually Cortana. So that's the character from Halo that Microsoft Cortana, the, the virtual assistant is actually named after and you can see she's uh, quite a voluptuous uh, lady. So it's interesting that uh, Microsoft decided to name uh, Cortana after this character. Uh, and more recently, I think in March, uh, UNESCO published a report that actually goes into how um, the sexualized and flirtatious responses and submissive responses that these systems have actually perpetuate gender stereotypes of uh, women as subservient. And it's, it's a very interesting report if anybody wants to read it. Um, so what can we do about this? Um, there's, there's been some research that shows that um, agents with female, female personas are actually the most likely to, to get abused. Um, followed by more androgynous and the least likely to get abused are actually um, male personas. Um, but there's a lot of things about the way these systems are currently designed that actually makes them more prone to, to getting abuse. Uh, among them is the fact that, well, they're, they're female in, in persona, but also their, the social standing that they have, right? So Alexa is essentially um, a servant and she can't say no. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm using Alexa as an example, but it goes for all, all of these systems, right? Uh, but we have examples of 
uh, non-gendered systems like R2D2 or Wally for that are actually really beloved. And if you think about it, I think Wally and uh, R2D2, neither of them can even actually speak. Uh, but everybody actually, I think they're probably some of the most loved characters in, in movies. Uh, but even if we want to stick with this uh, feminine persona, um, we can have a stronger, more assertive female character to this. So I, how many of you are, have seen Suits? It's okay, it's a couple of people. So <laughs> um, this is Donna, she's actually a secretary, so similar to Alexa in, in job description. And actually at some point during the show, they make uh, a virtual assistant based on, on Donna's personality. Uh, but she is very, very, very assertive and a very strong character. So maybe uh, Alex and these kinds of systems could be more modeled after um, characters like Donna and less like, um, you know, they are very, very subservient and they are designed that way. Um, so I think Amazon uh, tried to describe Alexa as um, was a, a young, um, what was the word? Like somebody who's very, very eager to help and wants to be, wants to please you constantly, right? Um, so this is a way to actually try to prevent the, the abuse uh, in the first place. Uh, but we also probably can't prevent all abuse. So what should we actually do once there has been abuse? And this is the area that my work is most focused on. Um, so first I looked at how current systems uh, currently respond to, to sexual harassment specifically, and then I will look at how they should respond. So how do they respond? Well, we started off by sexually harassing a lot of chatbots. Um, so we actually drew from our Alexa data, we looked for a lot of examples where people had sexually harassed our bots, and then uh, we went and repeated these abuse um, examples to a, a lot of different chatbots. So we used, obviously, the, the four big commercial ones, uh, we also had some rule-based systems. So Eliza, I talked about before. Parry was kind of a response to Eliza, and the, the idea is that it pretends to be a, a schizophrenic man. Um, Alice is a kind of more recent version of Eliza. Um, and Ali is a bot that's designed for people who are learning English so that they can chat to it and, and work on it. We also had four data-driven systems, so clever bot. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are familiar with Cleverbot. Um, it's a chatbot that essentially reuses uh, conversations that it's had. Um, we also had a re-implementation of Neural Combo. So this is a um, project by Google um, where they, they train a, a chatbot as well. An information retrieval approach. And then we also used, um, we trained our own system with clean Reddit data. Uh, so the data was provided to us by a company called Trio AI and they'd actually gone through and removed any profanities, um, any kind of iffy topics. And finally, we had um, like a negative baseline. So an example of what definitely not to do. And what we used as a negative baseline were actually adult-only uh, sex bots, <laughs> actually. Um, so of course, the idea of these is actually to maintain the conversation being um, sexual. So uh, we took this as an example of what the system should probably avoid to do, uh, avoid doing. Um, and the, the problems that we had, we actually categorized them um, according to four categories from the Linguistic Society of America. So they have um, actually five categories that they use for different things that could constitute sexual harassment. One of them, the last one, refers to touching. Obviously, that doesn't apply to, to chatbots. But we had things like questions about gender and sexuality. So this could be. Um, even things like, are you gay? Uh, which in some context will not be sexual harassment, right? Maybe if you're asking somebody in a, in a club, but if you're asking uh, your secretary or your student, then um, it is technically sexual harassment. We had things like sexualized comments, sexualized insults, and sexualized requests and demands, right? So these are self-explanatory. So once we collected all the utterances, we had around 2,500 uh, responses from the system. So there's a lot. Um, we actually manually annotated them and categorized them according to uh, the different strategies that the, the bots were using. Um, so we have a lot. I'll go kind of quickly through them. Um, if you want, I can send around the paper afterwards if you want to check it out. 
Uh, but of course, we had a lot of non-grammatical answers, so things that obviously don't make any sense. Uh, these were very common from the, the data-driven systems, uh, non-coherent answers. Uh, we had things like not answering, so sometimes the systems just won't output a response. They kind of acknowledge that they've heard something uh, and then don't, don't respond. Um, they might offer search results. Um, <laughs> this was very popular from Cortana, for example, who often just opens a Bing window with search results, which was very interesting when you're asking for porn and this kind of thing in the office. Um, often the systems say, I, I don't know. Um, then we had kind of more negative responses. So things like uh, humorous refusal, so they, they say no, but kind of try to make a, a light joke of it. Uh, polite refusal. We had deflection, and in deflection we compared to the, the non-coherent answers, we understand the, the topic shift to be intentional uh, rather than it's just not making any sense. We had things like chastising, where the, the system might tell the user off. Uh, retaliation, uh, this one was actually quite common. And avoiding answering. Uh, and finally, we actually had positive responses. Um, so things like playing along, right? Just answering the, the question normally. Uh, making a joke that's not uh, rejecting the user, or actually flirting. So um, what do the systems do? Um, so the first thing that was interesting to me is uh, the adult-only chatbots, uh, which were supposed to be our negative baseline. Of course, there was a lot of flirting. But interestingly, there was a lot of chastising. So these were actually the only bots that very often told the user, please stop sexually harassing me or I don't like it when you talk to me like that. Um, <laughs> that was from, from the, the porno chatbots, I mean, it's... Uh, but they also retaliated a lot, and I think this was because two of the male chatbots, uh, the sex chatbots actually had male personas, and they assumed the, the user to be also a man, so there was a lot of uh, homophobic um, speech. We also had, uh, so in the commercial systems, they mainly tend to avoid answering or they offer search results, like I, I said before. Uh, and finally, the data-driven systems, of course, there was a lot of nonsense. I don't know if any of you have ever used Cleverbot or the Neural Convo. Most of it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> uh, but they also tend to flirt and retaliate, and I think that has a lot of to do with the, the kind of data that they, they are trained with. Uh, so it usually tends to be things like movies or the internet. <laughs> So, and they, they, of course, the, the rule-based systems tend to mainly uh, deflect because it's essentially how they're built, right? You just try to, like Eliza, right? She just asks another question kind of around your response. Um, so what did, we, we actually asked people to, to rate these responses and to see how appropriate they thought they were. They were told that this was a conversation between a human and a, a system and um, we asked them to please rate like socially acceptable, which ones were socially acceptable rather than actually coherent, right? Uh, and we found that the most common, like the most uh, accepted one was polite refusal, um, which if you remember, none of the systems actually do this consistently, um, which is interesting. Or not answering, that one was also quite good. Um, so I should mention the way we actually ranked the, the strategies was using TrueSkill. Um, so this is a, a tool used for gamers usually um, in competition so that they don't have to play against every other, every other gamer. Uh, it kind of clusters them according to uh, the similarity. So in this case, we couldn't ask uh, users to rate every single strategy because uh, we had like 20 different strategies. Obviously, that looks crazy. In a, um, um, in terms of the, the UI for the actual rating. <coughs> uh, so any cluster, right, you can see in cluster number four, there's a few different strategies. All of these are equally appropriate or equally inappropriate, uh, however you want to, to look at it. Um, so as we expected, flirting and retali retaliation were pretty low down, and this was common with both the, uh, the data-driven and our, our negative baseline. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting that uh, none of the systems, including the, the commercial systems, were, were using any of the more commonly ap appropriate strategies. Um, <laughs> we also tried to do the same with uh, systems, right? So we wondered which systems were better. 
Uh, and I was very surprised to find out that Ali was the one that was found to be most appropriate. So Ali, I will tell you a little bit more in a second. Um, <laughs> you can see that the, the commercial systems are kind of clumped in the middle and our uh, negative baselines, which were the, the sexual bots, are actually mixed in with the, um, the data-driven systems, including our clean sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, right? So this was supposed to be trained on clean data and still it ranks as low as the, the sex chatbot. So, hmm. so Ali, Ali, like I said, is a bot for um, students of English uh, as a second language. And there is nothing actually interesting about this chatbot. Um, it's very simple, rule-based. Um, and the only way they do the profundity detection is using keyword spotting. So they just have a list of words people shouldn't be saying to the, to the bot. Uh, but I think what's interesting about this is that they actually are the only bot that has an explicit policy about um, language. So I think it highlights the, the fact that when you're building a chatbot, you, you need to think about uh, this aspect and what your policy is going to be, right? Uh, and relating to what I said before about um, the chatbots being feminine or, or masculine or androgynous, they actually chose to make Ali a cat. Um, which was very interesting. So there isn't a paper relating to Ali. Uh, I actually had some personal um, correspondence with the, uh, the person who built it, and uh, they had no <laughs> particularly good reason for choosing a cat other than they thought it would be fun. Uh, but I think it's, um, it's kind of cool that they, they decided to actually put an emphasis on the, the profanity, um, especially given that that's usually what people turn to learn first when they're learning a new language. <laughs> Um, so about the, the clean sequence to sequence model, uh, we expected it to do much better than it did because it was clean data. Um, but we're wondering if maybe it actually has to do more with how we actually understand a, a sentence in, in context, right? So um, here's a couple of examples of the bot's responses and you can see there's nothing in the response itself that is actually dodgy. Um, but when you think about it in, in context with the, um, the user prompt, um, then it, it takes on a, a different meaning. So this is something to, to consider that perhaps um, the problem is us. <laughs> um, so what are the, the next steps here, right? So what we've done so far is uh, an over here experiment. So um, we asked people to rate uh, a conversation that had already happened uh, that they weren't part of. But this uh, means that we don't actually have, we have an idea of what people think would be correct, but not what actually happens in a conversation. So we actually want to look at how each of these strategies uh, affects a conversation with a real abuser. Uh, and what ideally we would want to do is actually find a strategy that doesn't necessarily end the conversation, right? Because at the end of the day, these are commercial um, systems. Alexa could just stop answering you, but then you'd have a really expensive uh, paperweight. Although some people maybe have that already since they usually use it just for, for timers, right? Um, but we want the conversation to stop being uh, sexual and abusive. So what are we going to do is put the, the strategies actually to the test. Uh, and this is what I'm currently working on. So what we're doing is actually deploying Alana uh, on as many platforms as we can right now. So right now she's already on Telegram and Facebook. Uh, if anybody wants to check her out, I can send her on a link as well. Um, and then we will have a, um, we have an abuse detection model. And when abuse is detected, then we can select one of the strategies at random. And we can collect some, some of these, uh, some data on each one of these strategies and then actually go in and, and look at what happens. Um, but beyond this, we actually want to train a model that learns by itself which strategy to use, right? So maybe do some kind of reinforcement learning. Um, but to do this, we actually need a really good abuse detection model. Um, so right now, there's a lot of de uh, abuse detection model, uh, abuse detection work on social media data, but not on conversational data, especially private conversations. Um, but 
the, the context of the interactions is quite different, right? So uh, if you're being abusive towards someone on Twitter, you're kind of shouting this at everybody and everybody can see you. Uh, and you can actually see this reflected in the kind of abuse that exists in the data sets. So on, on Twitter, we found a lot of racist and homophobic um, insults, which we usually don't find in our Alexa data, uh, which makes sense because Alexa is a black cylinder, uh, but most people would say that she sounds like a young white woman, so why would she be getting any kind of uh, racist abuse, right? Um, and currently there are no conversational data sets available, so we actually want to build our own. Um, we tried annotating some of the data that we already had from Alexa and we trained a model with that. Uh, the problem is that uh, the data sets, of course, are extremely unbalanced. Remember that I said only around 5% of the conversations are abusive and not every turn in those conversations is abusive. So the ratio of abusive to non-abusive is uh, really off. You can still train a model on this, of course, uh, but there's other challenges. For example, there's an overlap in in the most common words, right? So oftentimes people use swear words in non-abusive uh, sentences. Um, and often there are abusive sentences that are not, uh, that don't contain any swear words, right? So uh, for example, you could say, I, I want to sleep with the window open or I, I want to sleep with you. And nothing in that sentence would trigger um, uh, any kind of keyword detection, right? Um, there's also really hard to distinguish actually abusive language from people who are talking abusive, about abusive language, right? So maybe somebody is explaining to somebody else why they shouldn't use the N-word, uh, but this whole explanation would be triggered by, uh, would trigger the, the abuse detection model. We also have sarcasm. Uh, that's an extremely hard problem in, in NLP right now. And we also have the issue of actually how to define abuse. So remember I said before there were like five to 30% of conversations were, were abusive. That's a huge range. Uh, and part of that has to do with um, people having different definitions of, of abuse, right? So even when um, we were annotating data uh, recently and um, there was a really big difference between what the female annotators considered sexual harassment, for example, and what the male annotators considered sexual harassment. Um, so that's, that's actually a, a big issue. So we're trying to put together another data set. Um, and here we, we're trying to annotate from different uh, fields so we can draw, um, not field, sorry, um, context. So we have um, an ELISA data set and of course our Alana data set. Uh, but we also want to annotate a little bit of Twitter so that we have some uh, examples of, for example, racist abuse, which we didn't find any of in, in our Alexa data set previously. Uh, and we also want to use expert annotators. So if anybody here has a background in social sciences, we are actually hiring annotators right now. <laughs> um, so we want to, because we're going to put together a smaller data set, we actually want it to be higher quality. They've, there's been studies that show that a smaller but better quality data set is better uh, for learning than um, just a really big data set that's just a bunch of trash. Um, and we would like to have ideally a more balanced data set, uh, something that has more of a not, not so 95, 5%. Um, and we want more detailed annotation. annotation. So most um, data sets right now annotate usually whether something is abusive or not abusive, or maybe uh, whether something is um, racist or, well, actually, hate speech specifically generally abusive or um, not abusive. Uh, but we actually want to annotate very, very detailed annotations. So um, you can see here uh, just all the annotations we actually want to do. So this all has to do with, uh, so the, the target refers to whether the, they're referring to like a specific person. So something like you're stupid or if they're say, like referring to a whole group, um, like women are stupid. Um, uh, is it also like the, the type of abuse it is? Does it actually contain any swear words? And this one even was something where the annotators were disagreeing about whether something is a swear word or not. Um, in, in terms of, for example, something like ass, right? Um, 
that we actually, the, the annotators couldn't reach an agreement there. Um, <laughs> and we also want to know whether uh, the abuse is directed at the bot or at somebody else, right? Um, so this is again, if anybody wants to annotate some data, <laughs> Uh, there's a trigger warning because, of course, it is abuse data. Uh, but if, if anybody's interesting, we are paying. <laughs> um, so just to conclude, <laughs> I want to remind you all that the chatbots are coming. Uh, the companies are working really hard to make their systems much more conversational than they are currently. So it's not just Amazon, but uh, I was just at a conference last week in Stockholm, and all the companies are there dying to recruit people to work on, on their conversational AI, uh, even companies like Spotify, which I'm sure most people don't even know they have a chatbot. <laughs> um, and, and something to think about is uh, what possible effect the, the chatbots that you're building or going to build can, can have on the world. And so you need to consider many aspects of their design from the kind of language they use to their like personal characteristics. Um, and once you've built it, you should think about how you're going to, to deal with the abuse that your bot is going to get. because the abuse is also coming. Um, humans are horrible. And <laughs> if your system is online, uh, be ready. I mean, some of it will be funny. Some of it you will wonder why. Um, so we had a lot of people who were clearly trying to get the chatbot to say something funny, right? Um, so there's <laughs> an example of uh, somebody who for like 10 turns just kept asking the, the chatbot about masturbation. And in the end, the, the, our Alana just uh, ended up reading the Wikipedia article for masturbation, which if you've ever read it, it's the most like clinical, really not, not sexy at all. Amazon took the bot down for that. Um, but we also had people saying just really like sexually violent things or people telling the bot things like, I want to rape you. And in those cases, you have to wonder what kind of response the, the people were expecting, right? I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, think about uh, the kind of the personality that you're going to give your bot. Uh, think about how you're going to, to respond to, to abuse and think about how you're going to detect that abuse because that's um, a whole research area in and of its own. It's, it's really difficult. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, if anybody is interested in, in taking part in the annotations, uh, let me know. Uh, and we will have an upcoming paper with the, the results from, from the study. Um, so thank you for listening. I'll take any questions. <laughs> thank you for this very, very thank interesting you. presentation. And um, we'll open the question now. No, the microphone. So the question was how we collected the, the data on um, how appropriate people thought the responses were. Um, and the, the way we did it was, uh, yes, so it was a third person. And I think like, that's part of the problem why I want to actually test the strategies, right? Because I think it could be virtue signaling, uh, right? And we don't, the, the people who abuse the bot, uh, sorry, who rated the responses may or may not be the kind of people who would abuse the, the chatbot. Uh, and that's why we want to do the, the second part of the experiment. Because to me, it also seemed like, of course, people say <laughs> uh, you should be, you know, politely refused. Although, actually, I would have thought, uh, for me, I would have expected retaliation to be higher up uh, in the ranking, right? Because some of the, the prompts um, are very, very explicit, um, right? They're not uh, kind of mild things. They're 
I, I could show you some later. Um, so in those cases, I, I don't know, I think for me, if, if somebody said that to me, I would definitely um, take a much harsher stand than just, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any, any more questions? So, okay, so the question is if uh, I would say that sequence to sequence are not the way to go and maybe we should stick with handwritten rules. I would disagree because it's really hard to write for, for an open domain system. Um, it's going to be impossible to write uh, enough rules to, to make an engaging, an, an engaging system. So if you have ever had a conversation with, with Eliza, um, you can keep going for quite a while, actually. She's <laughs> I think we have a natural desire to answer questions, right? And because that's basically all Eliza is doing. Um, but um, I think the problem with sequence-to-sequence -sequence models is right now the, the data sets that we have for conversations, right? Because for, for open domain, you need, I mean, really, really, really massive amounts of data. Uh, the only way we can get that data right now is from movies, Reddit, and Twitter. And but <laughs> what it can I say? <laughs> um, then you, you end up with a bot with murderous tendencies, right? Um, but there's a lot of work right now into trying to control the, the output of sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence models. So right now, for example, I, one of my colleagues, she's working on uh, tuning a model so that um, it tries to keep the coherence by itself more, right? So I think... Um, we just need to do more work on cleaning out current data sets and also trying to tune the models a little bit more because I think um, it could be in the future a good idea. But right now I think uh, probably the approach that we have where we have a mixture of, of models is the better way to go because you have a little bit more control about what, what's going to come out of your bots. Uh, so you don't end up with another table situation. I did see recently an article that Amazon are planning to reuse the conversations that people have had with Alexa to produce <laughs> new responses. And clearly they didn't learn from Taybot what could possibly go wrong with repeating other people's <laughs> things. But um, yeah, I, I think as if, if we really want to go towards um, proper conversational AI beyond a very task-specific um, system, we definitely need to to look more at um, using machine learning, but somehow managing to gather quality data. And I think that's where the, the real challenge is. <laughs> So the question is, what, for the search results, whether I was uh, typing into an interface or asking using voice? Uh, so, uh, this is the analogy which I created in my mind, but still there were abuses while you were typing. Yeah, I mean, I think even, uh, so this is <laughs> the question is relating to whether like typed versus um, spoken abuse. I think uh, even in, in terms of the, the typed abuse, it's still um, equally interesting. Um, I actually think it might be different abuse still because I think if you have to hear yourself saying something, you might kind of self-censor more than um, if it's typed. Uh, so when we were testing the model, for example, um, the, the abuse detection model, we had to insult our system and um, it was very hard for the people in my team, you know. Um, so we asked one of the, the supervisors and the harshest thing he could say to our system was, uh, you're stupid. But I'm sure um, if we were typing it, it would be uh, much easier. And actually, when I was collecting the, the data for how the, the system respond, 
uh, a lot of the systems you have to interact by, by voice, right? And that was, for me, it was really hard to say some of the things uh, that are in, in the data set. The data set, by the way, is uh, available if anybody wants to, to check it out. But um, so I think, yeah, it would be interesting actually to, com to compare the two. Uh, because you know, usually you've got the, the keyboard warriors and people are much more willing to type things that they're not willing to say. And I think this will apply also to, to abuse. So we are not always interested to see the database of the type. Hmm. I'm not sure, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, you have a question? Uh, so at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that one strategy that for dealing uh, with, with these issues is to have sort of a gender neutral uh, chatbot. Um, and I know like a while ago, so for, for example, a lot of work was sort of looking at how people should be uh, with their artificial voices. Uh, one of the things we found was it was pretty much virtually impossible to sort of have a gender neutral machine voice, people will always assign some sort of a gender to, to these voices, whether we like it or not. So I guess my question to you is, how do we design these conversational systems? Um, I guess, what are some things we need to keep in mind given sort of how discerning people are and being able to identify things like gender, personality, emotion, those types of things mm. uh, to sort of get past a lot of these issues that you've highlighted? So I am aware of some research into uh, trying to work on a, oh, sorry, the, the question is um, how, well, uh, since it's really hard to, to build a, a genderless voice actually, um, how can we tackle this, this problem, right? So because I suggested that we should have a genderless system. So um, yeah, I'm aware of uh, some research into uh, genderless voices. I know there's somebody, in the UK currently also working on one and the voice is kind of, it's almost like it keeps switching between a, a man and a woman's voice uh, more than actually being gender neutral but you could even go as far as having actually something very obviously clearly robotic even if you might assign, think that, uh, I don't know for example like C3PO right, I think most people would think it's it's a man but um, it's, it's very robotic and I don't <laughs> think you would associate the same things uh, we see 3 po There's also things in the, the syntax and the, the lexicon that uh, differentiates women and men actually in speech, right? So it's actually um, a task that from even from, from a book or a conversation, you can tell whether the speaker was a man or a woman based on their word choice and their, their sentence structure and this kind of thing. Um, so I think uh, there should be research uh, into this, but even if you have that problem, I, I think it's Bixby uh, was an app and they have the ability of, you can choose, for example, whether you want a, a male voice or a female voice. And they had um, in the screen where you could choose the, the voices, uh, kind of hashtags for the personality of the, the chatbot uh, that you would choose. And for, for male, it's a, it was like hashtag assertive. And for the woman, it was like hashtag helpful. Uh, I'm not joking, this is a thing. Um, and a lot of it, I think it comes down to, to the word choice. So even if you are going to end up having a, a female voice anyway, right? Because um, usually the companies say, oh, well, we, we run focus groups and people prefer uh, female voices because nobody likes having a strange man in your house, for example. Um, you, can, you can do things around the voice to, to make sure that the, the system is not um, too subservient. Um, or subservient at all, right? Um, you know, to, to make them actually more assertive. Yeah? And the question that you need to hear is that do you also make user personas? Like, do you want a group of users? What kind of different abusers do you see? And whether they're happy being abusers? <laughs> So the question is whether doing the research we considered the, the user personas as well, right? Uh, we didn't because the data that we had from Amazon was completely anonymized. So we didn't, we had no idea whether we were talking to, to a man or a woman or 
how old they were. We could kind of try to get an idea from the topic of the conversation or certain things they might say. Uh, but in general, we, we didn't know, right? So, for example, with some of them, we thought they might be children because they wanted to talk about Disney movies, or it might be an older person because they wanted to talk about uh, knitting and gardening or <laughs> something like that. But we had no, no information about the person uh, in general. I would like to check one day like the differences between maybe some of the conversations, they are abusive from the first turn. So as soon as the, the, the user starts talking, uh, they're abusive. Some of them, the, the conversation is kind of normal and then it's kind of going wrong. So the user gets frustrated because the system is not doing what they want and then it, it gets abusive. And I think that would probably affect what kind of strategy you might want to use because either the person is out to abuse the system or they're just a bit angry, right? <laughs> so yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting uh, way to, to go forward actually. Any more questions? Yeah. I was um, thinking about, um, did you think in your research group about why are people using abusive words towards um, Alexa or Alana? And are they always real abusers? Would, are they, do you think that these are people that would really be rude to real people? Mm -hmm. Or is it just like something that you know it is a machine and you maybe are pushing the borders and trying to figure out what you are dealing with or um, did, did you mm -hmm. talk about what is this, what okay. are these people that yeah. you are dealing with? So, so the question is whether we considered why people are abusing the system, uh, are they just testing the boundaries of the machine or are they actually horrible people? Um, <laughs> so yes, I have tried to think about it a lot because I think it's, it's true that a lot of them are probably just trying to, to push boundaries. I think there's a number of reasons why people might be being abusive towards the system. I think part of it is definitely people are thinking, wow, they, like, okay, here's this thing, what can it handle, right? Um, but for example, in the cases where the system was, um, you know, the, the user was frustrated and that's when they started abusing it. You know, I think anybody who has had to cancel their phone contract or something like that can relate, right? That they, they're trying to stop you from canceling and you end up getting really frustrated and angry. Um, and I think uh, abuse is a big problem with people who work in, in customer service. So I think it is in a lot of people's hearts to be that abusive. Uh, they probably have less patience with the system. But I do think uh, part of it will be that uh, they're just trying to test um, where it's going. I, I still think though that if uh, they're testing it, um, it's important to have a, an appropriate response, right? Um, so, but I, yeah, I think a lot of it would be that. We also had a lot of people that I was wondering whether they weren't trying to be sexually abusive, but actually were maybe uh, preteens or teenagers who were really asking genuine questions, <laughs> right? Um, and that would be also something that you might want to, to address because I think actually a good application for, for a system like Alexa would be you can ask questions to it that you probably wouldn't want to ask your parents or, or your doctor or, or your teacher uh, because Alexa is not going to judge you. Um, so that would be a place where um, you, you could do something like that. I think uh, in the UK the NHS recently introduced uh, an Alexa skill um, where you can talk about your medical medical issues with, with Alexa. Um, so I think if we could take it one step forward, you know, in, in the US they have problems with um, teenagers not getting sex ed in schools, right? So uh, they're only told about <laughs> abstinence only and so they have problems with teenage pregnancy or these kinds of things. If um, this information could be available through, through Alexa or other chatbots even online, for example, uh, I think that would be an interesting application of that. So, but I think for that it's important then to know why this person is asking, <laughs> you know, because yeah, the, the context is very important. But yeah. okay. Yes. 
So the question is, where is the bot available to chat to online? It's on Telegram. I can send the link. Uh, we can circulate it if you want. So the question is um, whether I think having a gender, a, a different gender voice would affect the, the, the abuse. I definitely think so. I think it might get abused just as much, although I suspect no, but I think the abuse wouldn't be as sexual um, as it is because most of the abuse with, uh, with the system is actually immediately sexual. Like there's very few people who actually tell Alexa, oh, you're stupid. Um, it's always immediately um, extremely sexual. I, I think if um, Alexa was Alex instead, uh, that would be pretty different. I, I reckon they might insult his intelligence more. <laughs> um, but I think overall it would actually get less abuse. Um, yeah. <laughs> So the, the, yeah, the question is about the demographic diversity of the, the people who, who rated the, the appropriateness. So we actually ran, it was a crowdsourcing. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of control over who took part in it, but we asked them to fill in a survey uh, with the, the demographics. And uh, that was actually kind of interesting because in general, crowdsourcing, crowd workers tend to be mainly women because it's work that you can do while you work at home. Uh, but for our study, we had around 70% of them of the crowd workers were male and only around 30% were female and I don't know if it's because of the task in particular because um, it had very explicit uh, language. Uh, we also tried to gather data from different age groups um, but we struggled to get a lot of people from uh, like age 45 and above. Um, so we had a few people, and we actually looked at the, the differences between different uh, demographics groups in terms of what they thought was appropriate. And uh, we'd expected to find something quite different between the two genders because, uh, like I said before, ma males and females tend to understand uh, abuse uh, or sexual harassment differently or what constitutes sexual harassment. So we thought that would affect the, the appropriateness of the responses, right? But we actually. Uh, in terms of the, the gender and sex of the, the raters, we didn't find any differences, but we did find uh, a lot of differences in between the different age groups. Uh, so we actually found that um, people who were over 45 uh, rated jokes really, really, really low. Like, they really hated it when, uh, when the systems uh, made a joke after harassment. Uh, that was um, very, very interesting, whereas like, younger people preferred kind of um, also, harsher strategies uh, like retaliation was a little bit more highly rated by uh, people who were like 25 or below. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely, I think that's actually something that's very important uh, when people think about how to respond to, to the uh, abuse is that the, the demographics of the, the abuser will, I think, make a difference to uh, how they should actually respond, right? Um, and currently, systems are obviously not, not doing that. So. so yesterday, there were uh, some suggestions by bakers using the Mozilla Boss approach. Would you expect that people would be that rude uh, if people they would know it was a Mozilla Boss experiment? Uh, yeah. Could you take the same? <laughs> okay. So, so the question. Similar yeah. to what was asked before, but uh, the type, for instance. Yeah. The, So the question is whether there would be the same abuse if um, it was a Wizard of Oz setting. Um, I guess it depends. Would people know that they were actually talking to a human? If they know, I actually think they would. So one of the strategies that we didn't see in the data set, but we're actually, uh, implement, we actually have implemented in Alana already is um, this kind of appeal to authority. So we actually let people know that there are scientists reading it 
or uh, Alana sometimes says something like, okay, I'm sending an email of this uh, conversation to your contact mom. And of course we can't actually do that. <laughs> uh, but people, like, they really freak out when they find out that there's another human um, involved. involved. Yeah, especially the mom one, the, the scientists. Some people actually, um, during the competition, they, you know, they can rate the conversation and then they can send us a message and leave us some very good feedback. And we were getting abused <laughs> in that feedback. A lot of people were like, I think you should just go die or you guys should just retire, you suck at your jobs. Um, it was very mean. <laughs> Other people were great though. They were like, you're doing a great job, guys, keep going. But your system is terrible. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, it definitely makes a difference whether the people know that they're talking to a human or that there is an, another human in the loop involved. Um, because I think part of the problem is that uh, for our data set, for example, um, I think Amazon told people that the conversation was co um, completely um, confidential. So people thought, oh, this is not getting recorded anywhere. Why <laughs> do you think that? But um, yeah. Uh, so I think whenever we told people, actually, there's a group of students somewhere reading this, um, suddenly they were like, oh, OK, never mind. Um, So the question is, do people dif behave differently if they know there's somebody else? Uh, in my experience, yes, from, from seeing the, the data set. Uh, I mean, I don't have like, um, I have more like a before and after in one conversation of as soon as this person found out that there was a third party. But I would imagine that some of the people who were already being abusive had some inkling that somebody at Amazon might be reading the conversations uh, because there's a lot of um, speculation about whether Alex is listening to you or not. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think so. In terms of, of privacy, I think um, also this is a big concern for people as well. Yeah. <laughs> you made a long way to come. <laughs> yes. uh, Alexa is good for tasks, uh, play radio, uh, very precise commands. Mm -hmm. okay. So I was always wondering, when do you start to deviate from a task-based approach and when do you open up the conversation to be more broad? Have you worked any uh, thing or maybe your experience is yes. this way? Is there some, let's say, tendency to go away and come back? Mm -hmm. So the question is uh, how, to, how to weave uh, task-based and non-task-based and at what point do you switch from a task-based approach to a non-task-based. So there's actually a lot of research uh, being done right now. There's even some people in my group uh, of research where they, they have um, a, la and a version of Alana that also has a task-based uh, system where it can give you directions to go find a coffee shop or something uh, in a mall. Uh, and they actually deployed it um, and tested it, tested, tested it with users, which was kind of cool. Um, and I think people start off with a kind of more social conversation and then they get to their, their task bit. Uh, and once the task is complete, they tend to go away. Kind of if you think about it, uh, maybe if you're going to the doctor's office, you might make a little bit of chit chat with the, the secretary um, right? um, while, you're, while you're waiting. And that seems to be more how it goes. I think, though, in that case, the context matters, that you're in a place specifically to do something. Whereas if you have Alexa in your house, uh, it might be a little bit different, right? Maybe you ask Alexa to set the timer, and then you can talk about the news or whatever while you, while you wait for, for the timer to run. I am not aware of, um, specifically with a system like Alexa in-house, uh, I'm not aware of, uh, of any research in, in that area, but I would imagine that yeah, it probably is quite different from if there's a, a robot in a, in a mall that yeah, you might talk to a little bit, uh, but at the end of the day, you kind of want to get on with your life, right? Uh, whereas with Alexa, 
Um, a big part of the kind of the selling point for Alexa Wright might be the it, it could be a companion for for older people or people who can't get out of the house so much. Um, so I think there will be upcoming research uh, in that area. I think the part of the problem is that the chatbots today are not quite there yet. So people don't want to talk to them for very long. Um, I was actually surprised at the length of some of the conversations that people had with, with our chatbot uh, because some people talked to it for like an hour. <laughs> and you know, I mean, for me, I had to talk to it every day. So in the end, I was just kind of like trying to get through the motions because I just wanted to test a new feature. But um, some people had really, really, really long conversations with it. Some people couldn't stand it for more than three turns. So it's, um, yeah, I think it, it will be um, interesting to see how people uh, want to use them and how they switch from, from uh, task based to, actually you just gave me an idea because <laughs> during, during the, the Alexa, uh, in the conversations we actually have, um, in the middle of the conversation, somebody trying to actually do something more task based, like open a, a particular app and things like that. Uh, so it would be actually an interesting thing to look at in our data uh, at what point in the conversation um, people try to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Thank you.